California and seen the sequoias or the redwood trees. Yeah, I mean, some people have been there before. And the reason why I'm going to tell a little story here to illustrate what the uh, sermon is about today, we're talking about standing firm and being strong in the Lord today. And one of the reasons we could do that, uh, looking at what we see with the redwood trees, when uh, Diane and I went through there and saw it, we actually drove through one of the sequoia trees, and I'm thinking, gee, it's amazing how those things could stand so far and so long and be so strong. And it, when I was thinking about that for this message, and I'm thinking, it's a pretty good illustration of, of strength and, and steadfastness. It says that the redwoods have, exist, have existed along the coast of Northern California for about 20 million years and are related to a tree species that have existed for almost 160 million years ago. So they've been around. They can reach heights of nearly 400 feet, which is roughly the equivalent of a 37-story uh, skyscraper. Uh, so high that if you're at the bottom of one of those trees, you look up, you're going to lose them in the clouds and not really able to ever see the top of them. So they're very high. They can uh, live an average of 500 to 700 years, and a few of them have been documented to live as long as 2,000 years. They're highly resistant to disease due to a thick protective bark and a high tannin content. Now, those who are tannin content experts in here, you can kind of tell me what that's all about. But needless to say, those things are very resistant to disease because of a thick covering. Said so redwood tree roots, this is what's kind of interesting, I was researching this, redwood tree roots, say that fast three times, their roots are very shallow uh, when it comes to as far as how big they are. The roots are only about five or six feet deep, which is kind of strange in itself. But here's what causes them to stand the strength of time and, and stand and remain standing, is that they, they thrive in thick groves where the roots intertwine with each other for almost 100 feet between the trees. And what that made me think about is that those trees are standing strong and standing firm, not just because of a single root system that they have, but they depend upon each other for strength and support. And I'm thinking, boy, that's a beautiful illustration as far as what this church is like. Because like I said, Diane and I have been to a, a lot of different churches. We've never seen a church like this one, which stands by each other, leans on each other, helps each other out, and loves on each other. I can say that without a doubt, and I'm preaching it right now. And so uh, it's a testament to what it means to stand strong and be firm in the Lord. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. The message is talking about be strong and stand firm. And there's the initial slide. And what we're going to be looking at is the following three areas. We're going to be concentrating mainly in Ephesians 6, 10 verses 10 and 11, and it's the beginning of a, a part of a series that we're going to be looking at dealing with the armor of God. We're going to be talking about different parts and pieces of the armor of God and how that armor allows us to stand firm and be strong in the Lord. The areas we're going to be looking at today are three topics in general, one of them is, is what does it take to be strong in the Lord? And that is in Joshua 1, 6 through 9. So in your Bibles, you can bookmark Joshua 1, 6 through 9. The next section we're going to be looking at is what does it mean to stand firm? What does it take to stand firm against Satan? And we're going to see that primarily in about three other verses, but the primary verse that we're going to be looking at is 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And then we're going to finalize the so what. Why do we need to stand strong? Why do we need to be firm in the Lord? What's that purpose? And we're going to see that as we culminate with everything in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, which is the full encompassing verses dealing with the armor of God. So now we see where we're going to be going in today's message. And to make sure in your Bibles, if you have them, if you don't have one, there's some Bibles in the pews, so go ahead and grab it, and at least go to Ephesians 6.10, because that's the first verse that I'm going to read in God's Word. And the reason why I read God's Word is that it would be errant and wrong for me to come up here and preach without backing it up with Scripture. 
I firmly believe that if I'm going to preach and proclaim the gospel of the Lord, I need to make sure that it is rooted in God's word. Otherwise, I would be up here just to pontificate. And you can get that on TV anytime you want. But I'm here to preach God's word, and this is what it says in Ephesians 10. Chapter 6, verse 10 of Ephesians. And this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And they were talking about all the different Christian households there. They were also talking about false preachers that were going along at that point in time. And also the evidence of what they had of false teachings dealing with spirituality. And so Paul said, I got to write to these people in Ephesus and tell them this is what you need to do. And the only way that you can actually stand against the falsehoods that were prevailing in Ephesus at that time on his second and third journeys was this statement that he said. So in Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That's an easy verse to memorize. So we're going to be looking at what does it mean to be strong in the Lord? The original Greek interpretation of be strong or strong is to be strengthened or to continue to be strengthened or to increase in strength. That's what it meant to be strong in the might of God. This kind of strength is only available through Jesus Christ. And all of us have probably seen a verse that we always fall back on quite a bit in the Philippians 4.13. You know what that one says. It says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Amen. And that's what we have to guide ourselves on. We have to be strong in the Lord. Joshua 1, verses 6 through 9. I'm going to turn to that, and you can kind of listen to me if you want. If you're really good with your Bibles, you can get to it real quick, too. It's in the Old Testament. You probably going to get to it a lot faster than I am. And here's Joshua. The Lord came to Joshua and told Joshua, you know what? Moses is dead. As if Joshua probably didn't know that already. But the Lord said, Moses is dead. You need to now take the whole Israelite nation across the Jordan River and go to where I've uh, promised your ancestors and Moses, this promised land. And he laid out the whole thing to Joshua. Now, if I was Joshua, I'd probably think, oh my gosh, that's a pretty big deal. I was kind of happy having Moses being my leader and I can just stick in his shadow and not worry about anything. But now he was thrust forward. And he knew, because he went across the Jordan River, he went out and spied the Hittites, the Philistines, the Jesuits, and they were huge fierce warriors. They were not anybody who could just lay down when they came across the river. They were going to face a foe that was pretty dominant in that region. So he knew what was going to happen. Joshua had that feeling. But the key thing about Joshua, and this is what we should take on ourselves, is that he depended on God. He knew that his Lord, our Lord, was not going to forsake or leave him. And so this is what God said to, to Joshua. Joshua 1, verse 7, and we're going to read all the way down through, if you have your Bibles, going all the way down through into uh, verse 9. But I want to go ahead, and you know me, I go one verse ahead and one couple verses back and forth. That's what I do when I read my scripture. You do the same thing, because it's kind of neat, you kind of get a whole feeling of what's going on. In verse 5 of Joshua 1, it says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And this is God talking to Joshua. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Beautiful promise. And then we look at verse 6. Here's where God actually commands Joshua, just like he commands us to do this. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Then what does God do? Verse 7. Boom, he hits him again. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. 
Beautiful verse. Beautiful way of commanding us on how we're supposed to live. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What's that? Another promise. See how God sits there, and God will do this in, in his word. He'll throw out a command, a directive, a way of living that will keep you straight and in line with him. And when he does that, as you keep reading in the scripture, you'll see these promises. Now, here's what I'm going to say you should do, and I do it all the time. I write those promises down. I write those promises down because they give me a way of which to bolster my faith. Because it tells me right there, he says, if you do these things, you will be prosperous and successful. And that doesn't necessarily mean I want to be driving a Maserati out there or living in a $50,000 uh, or a 50,000 square foot house or whatever. No, what he means by that is that you will be successful to the point where you will be working for God and his glory every step of the way of your life. That's what success is all about. And then God says here in verse 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So what did Joshua do? Did he say, well, that's just God talking? No, Joshua in verse 10 says, So Joshua ordered his officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. He didn't hesitate. He knew that he had to be courageous, that he had to be strong. So when it comes to being strong in the Lord, it's commanded for us to do that. That's why I'm telling it right now today, as if you haven't already known that, but we need to be strong in the Lord. And so you're saying, okay, pastor, how do I be strong in the Lord? How is that done? And most of you probably already know the answer, but the key thing when it comes to being strong in the Lord, is that you'll see it in John 15, verses 5 through 8. And where that talks about, that's Jesus talking to his disciples. And he was talking about them abiding in him. Jesus said, abide with me. I am the branch, you are the vine. And that you're supposed to abide in me. I'm going to read that to make sure. I'm not going to misquote scripture right off the bat here. I want to make sure I have it. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's in John 15, verse 5. Verse 6 says, if you do not remain in me, you are much like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And the reason why this is brought up is that in order for us to be strong in the Lord, we must abide in Him, be grafted into Him. I don't know how many of us have ever grafted trees, but in order for us to have certain types of fruits and vegetables, there's grafting involved, where the vine and the branches come together to produce a fruit that's pertinent and very important to that particular tree or, or vegetable plant. And the thing is, is that we need to be in, calculated, in biting, abiding, be a part of him in order for us to be strong. Because if you think about it, if we are out by ourselves, wandering around by ourselves, and not being grounded in God's word, and not sit there and... and understanding him in prayer and in quiet time with him, we are leaving ourselves wide open to be attacked by Satan. Leaving ourselves wide open. And the only way we can be strong is through God's word. It's through praying. It's through being with him. And what does it feel like if you haven't prayed for a while? I mean, it's happened to me. There's been times I forget to pray. Yeah, it's a, and like Peggy said, it's kind of an empty feeling. It's kind of a, a weird, kind of queasy feeling where you're kind of wandering around and not really firmly rooted. You're not strong. You're not standing strong. That's what God does not want us to do. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to be a part of him, abiding with him, abiding with him, being with him every step of the way, and him with you. 
And that comes with uh, praying, getting in God's word. We must learn actually to, to lean on God in complete trust. That's one thing I, I, I have to work on all the time. Uh, especially when you're used to taking care of yourself and doing things for yourself. It runs contrary to our vein of thought an awful lot that we need to lean on somebody else for support. But much like those redwoods that have very shallow roots but are standing for more than 700 years or more, they are standing firm and strong because they're intertwined and leaning and working with each other to stand against the wind, the rain, the weather, the earthquakes, whatever takes place there in California. And so we need to understand that we need to come to the Lord in complete trust and walk with him faithfully. I mean, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 talks about that, where it says to lean on God, not on your understanding, in all your ways, look to him, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That's in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Another verse that came to mind, I want to bring it out, is in Hebrews, towards the very back of your Bibles. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 3, it's a very key, uh, key area. It says, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter and pioneer of our faith, and trusting in him. So that's a key part there when we look at, at Hebrews dealing with that particular point of standing strong. So what does it mean when I say in that second part, stand firm against Satan? Well, we must stand firm. And that's the second part of everything that we're looking at. Because when we look at being strong in the Lord, we found out in that first part, that being strong in the Lord is to make sure that we walk courageously and be strong in Him, like I said in Joshua. And then we understand that we need to go ahead and be in the Lord, abide with Him in everything that we do, be a part of everything He wants us to be. And then we learn that we need to do that through prayer and trust and faith in our Lord. And so those things give us the foundation of what it means to be strong. But when it comes to standing firm, that's a whole other ball of wax here we have to look at. And this is all a part of this armor of God that we're going to be talking about for the next three weeks. And when it comes to standing firm, we have to stand firm against Satan's schemes. In Ephesians 6.11, I'm going to turn to that real quick. You might have it in your Bibles also. Remember, it's GE Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Just a little side note. I got my, I got my GE, there's my Galatians. <coughs> Ephesians 6, verse 11 says this. Put on the full armor of God, that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. And take your stand against the schemes, that's another word, another way of saying standing firm. So that's what Ephesians 6, 11 talks about. We are to stand against him. Because if you think about it, what's the best way for us to persevere or, or to stand firm? I just gave you a hint. Is to persevere. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so we must persevere. We must stand firm. And what are the devil's schemes when we look about all the different things that the devil does? What are his two main tools that the devil uses against us? Disappointment. disappointment could be that one disappointment, okay. I heard it over here somewhere. I heard, I heard pride. Okay, pride. There's a bunch of different things, but the two main tools that he uses... The two main tools he uses are going to be pride and doubt. 
And he does that through throwing out half-truths or even lies that allows us to think, like with Eve, God really is not with me. So I'm going to go ahead and do what Satan said. I'm going to go and take this, uh, this fruit of the tree that I'm not supposed to so I know everything. There's where pride came into with Eve at the time. And then doubt is a big one. Doubt is where you sit there and, and are not really too sure about God's sovereignty. That he is in control of everything. Now how many of us have ever doubted God and his, his sovereignty? I have. I'm bad about it. So I have to work on that. So when I pray that he's sovereign, I, 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 I have to remind myself every time. When, when I got hit in that rear end collision this week, I'm going, where are you at, God? And, and you know... And he goes, well, I'm right here, Ed. You're still talking to me. So, you know. Uh, and then when my tires, all three tires went flat, and we were going flat, and then I'm going, where are, you, where are you at, God? He's going, well, you can get air in your tires, Ed. You're okay. You know, the thing is, is that I was doubting God. And it's when we're at our toughest time, at our weakest point, that we tend to feign in and crawl into ourselves and think that I can take care of myself mainly if I just ignore it or if I depend on somebody else or if I just sit there and say, woe is me and have a pity party. All three of those things aren't getting us anywhere. But when we depend and realize and stand firm in our Lord and know that He is there no matter what and that He is indeed in control, sovereign, then we can rest and realize and understand that we are indeed standing firm. I mean, I'm thinking of, gosh, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've been studying all about Daniel and how those three guys stood firm. Now, were they alone in that furnace? No, what happened? Nebuchadnezzar glanced, <laughs> glanced in through that furnace, which was actually just a big vat. He glanced inside there and said, hey, there's four guys in there. Who was that fourth person in that furnace with those men? Well, there's different commentaries say it was God, it was Jesus, it was an angel. But the case remains that they stood firm in the Lord. They we were strong in the Lord. They stood firm for what they believed in, which is a key part of what they were like. And how did God reward them? Did he just let them be burned to a crisp in that furnace? No. They came out from that furnace unbound. The things that mankind did to them were burned away. But the things that God did to them was that he brought them out of that furnace unsinged, not smelling a smoke, and perfectly alive. Now, if that doesn't tell you how great our God is, I don't know what does. And if that doesn't tell you what it means to stand firm, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a good example of what that means to stand firm in the Lord no matter what. It's all a matter of just Perseverance. Because we find in Romans 3, or Romans 5, 3 through 5, it, it gives a kind of a, a sequence of events where it talks about perseverance builds character. And then from character, you have hope. Then from hope, you're able to make your stand. Because it's an awful sad thing for those that are lost to not have any hope. And I've talked to some people that are, that are Muslim. And they're following the Islam faith. And, and it's very sad that they do not have any hope. The only way they're going to be able to do that is through works. And some of those works are disastrous. But they have to constantly figure out ways in which to take care of, of Allah. Now, he didn't say it on this pulpit right now. But our Lord, our Jehovah God is above all. We'll be like that forever. He's above everything, ab almighty. I'm going to start dancing up here. But the thing is, is that that's our God. And that's our hope. 
That's the hope that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego went through as they were dropped into that furnace, so much so that the people that were dropping them into the furnace were burned by the flames that were so hot before they even got to the point of dropping them in the furnace. So that's the hope that we have. We should stand on firm ground. Even during trials. And there's a verse that's coming to mind, and it's in Matthew. Matthew 7. And Matthew 7 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it has that famous verse about asking and seeking and knocking. That's a precursor to what Jesus was talking about. And this is pretty much, pretty much so at the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount. And here at this point in time, Jesus was speaking to the multitude of people, talking about wise and foolish builders, the true and false prophets. And there's a lot of people in this congregation that are construction workers, builders, workers, understand what construction is all about and what a foundation is all about. And this is what I wanted to bring out. When it comes to standing firm, we need to be standing on a firm foundation. Amen? Yeah, and it says here, Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, it says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That's why we sang the solid rock this morning. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, that sinking sand that we talked about in the solid rock. He built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It was not on a firm foundation. If we need to stand, and we do need to stand on a firm foundation, that's how we stand firm in the Lord. That foundation is found in our faith with him, our walk with him, how we live through tribulations and trials. When Diane and I were in, in Italy, we, we uh, toured the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We went to it. And I found myself constantly looking like this. But uh, <laughs> the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a grandest mistake of all kinds, but it ended up being one of the greatest tourist attractions there in the uh, Tuscany area in Italy. But in December 2001, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was finally reopened to the public. And it had been closed for almost 12 years because of the leaning. It kept on leaning. And the Italian officials were afraid it was going to fall. It was leaning almost about 18 degrees off center. Um, it cost them about $25 million to renovate. And what they did to stabilize the tower, and I, I think Shane can appreciate this, they went underneath that tower and dug out over 110 tons of dirt from underneath the tower, which reduced its famous lean by about 16 inches, and it stabilized. So they dug out 110 tons of dirt. That's a lot of dirt. They dug it out, brought it up, and then they backfilled it. You know, all to the point where it was just, uh, like I said, it was 17 feet further south than what it should have been. That's an awful lot of a lean. But what was the problem? Was it because of poor foundation, poor workmanship, an inferior grade of, of marble? It wasn't because of poor workmanship. Matter of fact, it was a beautiful structure to look at it. And the marble was immaculate. It was beautiful marble. But its main problem was it was built on what was normally around that Tuscany Valley area, a, a very sandy loam soil. And when they built it, they didn't realize that this stuff was going to wade away and rode away after a certain period of time. And that's what happened. So as it was eroding away on one side, it kept on leaning. Like I said, my notes have 17 feet further south. So just don't stand south of it. You'll be okay, I guess. <laughs> 
But the problem was, like I said, it was the soil. It was the foundation it was built upon. And that kind of leads on facts as far as where we are at. You know, where are we standing at? How firm is our foundation? We need to stand firm against Satan. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 16, 13. This is a neat verse. And it's a very short verse. It's one verse, but this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Be on your guard. Stand firm. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. One verse encapsulated everything I was talking about today. Because the church at Corinth was really in bad shape. It was not following God's laws. It was very corrupt. And that was just the way that was in that area there in, that, in uh, Corinth and Ephesus. Those, both those churches were going through a tough time. But it says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. And that's what we have to do when it comes to being strong. So the question comes is, why do I have to be strong and stand firm against Satan? Well, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, it talks about it. That's the whole armor of God. And you can look at it in your, in your quiet time. But what really happens in Ephesians uh, 6, 10 through 18, what is really key to that is that it talks in verse 12, especially if you've got verse 12 up there in Ephesians 6. Verse 12, Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For our struggle... This is what I want to kind of bring on as we come to a, a glide path down and start landing this plane. It says, for our strength is not, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's the key thing. And this was written to the church in Ephesus way, 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 way back. But can you see the relativity of it today? I mean, it's, it speaks of what's happening today. Because Satan still is spouting his half-truths. He's still working on people to be doubtful of his, of his sovereignty. Satan's still working on people thinking that God is not around, that God is dead, that God is not a part of what we're supposed to have. And God is not effective. Was all these little half truths and things that he's bringing into people's minds. But you know, we're, you know, greater is in us as in, in the world. The Lord's.